suited to become a ballerina. Like every other little girl. I could not sense, not help, a sense of wonder watching ballerinas like her. Her magical movements that flowed with the music effortless. And obviously, she is in complete control of her movements. When I grew older, I became a gymnast and a dancer, inspired by performances like what you see here. Again, you see the utmost elegance and effortlessness, together with a flexibility that is awesome, strength, but more. If you look how she manipulates the objects, the clubs, the ball, the hoop. Awesome. So ever since, I could not resist asking the question, how does she control her movements? How does the brain control such exquisite movements? Her movements, my movements, and yours. So this question has taken hold of me to turn me into what I am now. I'm a scientist of human movement control. So let's unpack that question a little bit and start with a common conception. There's a brain, and a part of the brain is the motor cortex that is dedicated to control our movements, and it sends down signals to the muscles that then contract, create movement, and there it is. We practice, and once we have practiced movements, we store them in some library. And then when we want to do the same movement again, we pull that script, run it, and voila. Well, this is not entirely untrue, but far too simplistic. There is much more to that. Let's unpack the brain a little bit. Let's open Pandora's box and look into that wonderful universe within, very similar to what we have out there. We have stars, neurons, galaxies of neurons. This immense complexity that you see right here is actually only the mouse brain. The human brain is more than a thousand times heavier, larger than this. In numbers, we have between 10 and 100 billion of nerve cells. Each of them has up to 10,000 synapses, making up a, a 100 trillion of connections. And all these connections form connections that go around the Earth four times. But that's not all. Let's look at the human anatomy, which is astonishing. 200 joints operated by 639 muscles. Each of those has up to 1,000 motor units, and each motor unit has up to 2,000 muscle fibers and more. We have sensors everywhere. We have them in our muscles, in the tendon, in the skin. And they give the body, the brain, information about the states of our muscles, about limb orientation, about tension, vibration, temperature, pain. All of that comes through the nerves into our brain. That then makes sense of it and controls our movements, right? Brain sends signals, a plan to the muscles, some feedback, and then correction, and all over again. Too simple still, because we forgot one thing, that there are two equally important parties, the brain and the body. What do I mean by the body? Well, the body in terms of its mechanics and dynamics. Mechanics matters. Look at this here. This is an artistic creation which beautifully illustrates what the body dynamics actually gives us. This creature consists of nothing else but of PVC pipes cleverly arranged such that when there is some wind energy moving this, it looks as if it were walking like an animal, as if it were alive. Now the important thing to realize is that this animal has no muscles, no senses, and no brain. Pure passive dynamics. So what does that mean for us, again, from a scientific point of view? 
The challenge now is to not only understand how the brain controls the body, but also how that body mechanics controls and influences the brain. In fact, how these two components interact and form a complex dynamical system. So let's go back to the ballerina and make some observations about rhythmic movements. So if I asked you to swing your arm on the side of the body just like this, you would do something very similar, maybe a little bit slower or a little bit faster, but definitely not something like this, nor would you do this. And why? Because the limb has a natural period. To understand that, let's go back to some all-time greats, to Galileo and Christian Huygens. The latter is the inventor of the pendulum clock. So how is that? What, what insights did they give us? Well, you see the pendulum here, and if you just make a little excursion, and then you drop it, you obviously know that it swings back and forth with a period that is fully determined by gravity that uh, acts as restoring torques and swings that pen pendulum around. As these all-time grades showed us that under some simplifying assumptions, the natural period is only determined by the length of the pendulum and gravity. Now, it's a small step to recognize that my arm is very similar to a pendulum. A little bit more complicated because there is friction and there is mass distributed, but nevertheless very simply described to have a natural period. So what does that natural period of our mechanical system actually give us when we move rhythmically? We did a little experiment uh, on that to tease apart the contributions of the brain and the body. So we asked our subjects to hold a pendulum in their hands firmly and then oscillate this pendulum around the wrist. We could compute the natural period of that pendulum hand system without invoking control. Then we measured what the subjects actually performed. And as you might imagine, not all of the subjects did the same thing. Some were a little bit slower than this natural period, some a little faster. But then we did an important step. We asked them to continue to swing that pendulum at their preferred rate, and those, and, and uh, sorry, and ask them to count backwards by seven, i.e. engage their brain in something very different and not concentrate on what they actually did with their hand. Now, what happened was that those participants that had faster periods, they sped up and those that had slower periods, they slowed down. So they approximated that natural period determined by the passive dynamics. I.e., what we learn is when the brain is engaged in other things, the mechanics of the body starts to emerge and take care of our movements. Let's go back to the gymnast and let's take a look at her, how she plays with the ball, literally plays. Because not only does she control the ball, but the ball has, again, a life of its own, and she plays with the ball and its contribution. So in order to tease apart what is the ball dynamics, what is the hand dynamics, we again did a very simple experiment and actually turned it into a task which is bouncing a ball on a ping pong paddle. So imagine you were to bounce a ball on a ping pong battle, paddle just like that, up and down rhythmically. In the beginning, you're variable, that's okay. But after a while, you become good. And in fact, you may be able to engage in a conversation while continuing to bounce that ball. So what we did was we took exactly that task and we modeled it. So there's some math. But very quickly, just focus on the key term, dynamic stability. And let me unpack that, and let me turn you back to your elementary physics classes. You may remember that idea of a ball in a well. 
And if you displace that ball, it rolls back to the minimum. And this is a stable system. Conversely, if that ball sits on the top of that hill and you kick it slightly, it loses its position and it doesn't go back up again. It is unstable. Now, this very concept of stability, we took and analyzed stability now in a dynamic system that is in a paddle bouncing a ball. And as the simulation shows you, you can have different drop heights and they both converge to the same amplitude while the paddle does nothing but going up and down in a sinusoidal fashion, meaning you can move in the same way and differences, perturbations and variability just dies out by itself. So our postulate is smart humans tune into this dynamically stable regime which is defined by contacting the ball in the upwardly decelerating segment of your hand. So in our experiments, subjects performed a very similar task in a virtual environment. They bounced this ball with this red paddle and were asked to bounce the ball up to that yellow line rhythmically. And then we examined whether they would find that dynamic stability. So they practiced for many trials and as you might expect, the variability goes down as with every skill that you practice. Importantly, we looked at this acceleration and ball paddle contact, and it was positive, which is unstable in that uh, physical sense. And after some practice, they converged to that stable regime where they could just go up and down in small variations in the ball, would not need corrections. It's a lazy, a smart solution, exploiting, harnessing the dynamics of the task. Let's go back one more time to the gymnast. Now she manipulates this very complex, flexible object of the ribbon. Again, with amazing ease and little effort, so it seems. Now, this is not for mere mortals like you and me. So you think? However, I may tell you that we operate objects with flexible dynamics every day when you grab your cup of coffee and you lead it to your mouth. Because this is a rigid object, there is flexible object, the liquid inside. When I exert forces on the cup, it exerts forces on the coffee and the coffee back to me. And this is highly complex. In fact, again, we developed a very simple model that is just an arc with a ball inside and analysis, math on the side for now, just to say there is chaos in coffee cup. And I use chaos in the technical term, namely deterministic chaos in a complex nonlinear dynamical system. Unpredictable, but you have little problem. Very rarely do you spill your coffee. So let's take a look in an experiment again to kind of get a bit more quantitative sense about that. So our subjects moved with a robot arm, moved that cup from the left to the right, and there is a little pink speed bump in the middle that in the beginning just throws them off and the ball comes out. After some practice, you can see how they overcome that speed bump. They preempt it, they overcome it. So what happened? Again, we take that notion of stability and analyze the model, and what you see here is the result of this analysis where these yellow volumes refer to those parts of the trajectory where the dynamics of the task provide stability. Same thing as before, but in a much more complex uh, context. So let's take a look at an early trial, how it evolves, and it doesn't get close to these yellow volumes. However, in a late trial, you can see the trajectory of the ball and cup evolving, and with a perturbation, it enters the volume where this task provides stability and they don't lose the ball. All right, so how does the brain control 
the movements. Well, I would say now what I showed you, we have to phrase that question slightly differently. Not only how the brain controls the body, but also how the body is harnessed by the brain. So my answer to the initial question is the brain exploits and harnesses the dynamics of the body. Now, much more work needs to be done to tease that apart. However, I do want to tell you that aside from all the work that's been done and is still ahead of me, I haven't lost the sense of wonder for these beautiful movements and an appreciation also for the seemingly simple movements that I and you perform every day in your life. Thank you.